Olá, seja bem-vindo ao Campo Diplomático, espaço dedicado às relações do Brasil com o mundo. Eu sou Catiúcia Soto Maior e hoje converso com o embaixador do Egito no Brasil, o Aer Abul Majd. Diplomata de carreira, tem 34 anos de experiência, com destaque ao trabalho com as Nações Unidas, em Genebra e em Nova York. Missões em Nova Delhi, Washington e Canadá. O embaixador está no Brasil desde novembro de 2019. Com formação em Direito Público Internacional e mestrado no tema pela Universidade de Londres, ele também é especialista em Direitos Humanos, Assuntos Ambientais e Mudanças Climáticas. Welcome, Your Excellency. Thank you very much for your presence. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Now let's start talking about the role of agribusiness in Egypt, like it has more than 7,000 years. And today, what is the main importance of this? Well, as you correctly said, Egypt is a very old country and agriculture has always been the center of our economic growth and development and well-being. Um, in, in the modern times, of course, we have kept up with the times, but agriculture remains a core part of our economy and our GDP. It accounts for about 28% of Egypt's GDP, with uh, about 14 or 15% of total employment in the Egyptian market. And the Nile remains an important part of it, right? Absolutely. How does it, it work? It's 95% of uh, the agribusiness agri is around uh, the river. That's correct. Actually, uh, Egyptians live only exclusively by the Nile, and we rely on the waters from the Nile for 95% of our needs, with very little uh, groundwater and almost of rare rainfall. Uh, so, so we depend heavily on the Nile, and that is the importance of the River Nile for us historically, and the reason for a civilization where we live. But uh, our development programs and projects focus on the well-being of the farmer and the communities and make it in the core, at the core of our development. Uh, that's why we make sure that our farmers uh, are provided with the necessary uh, capacity to develop, with the necessary technology to keep up to date with, with the developments and also with uh, understanding marketing and availability of markets for their products. So really the core of the development of the sector is on the farmer and the small farmers in particular uh, that are the center of our agriculture uh, uh, business. So we can say that uh, main produce is from organic products too and fa uh, farmers too and uh, family farmers, right? Absolutely, they, they are the core, they are the center. Uh, we have small ownerships as the majority in Egypt rather than large uh, conglomerates or corporations. Um, the term organic, of course, now in the market means that absolutely no outside you know, fertilizers or anything are introduced, but, but if the concept is that they're small owned, very small uh, properties owned by each farmer and family, uh, that is exactly what the case is in Egypt. Talking about fertilizers, Brazil buys uh, a lot of fertilizers from your country, right? Mm -hmm. How is the relation, the bilateral relation with our country, mm -hmm. the highlights, what you export, what do you import? Sure, agriculture is, is almost the core of our uh, trade relation between Egypt and Brazil. Um, of course, it's well known fact, Brazil is a mega producer of so many uh, agricultural and, and animal products. So uh, there's an imbalance in the trade uh, in uh, favor of Brazil. Um, we sell to Brazil, uh, uh, the bulk of our sales to Brazil and uh, uh, exports are fertilizers of all uh, types, uh, but also some uh, petrochemical products and petroleum products, as well as cotton and some other agricultural products uh, such as citrus fruits and other uh, olives and garlic and other products. The main, the, the core, the, the bulk of our imports from Brazil, on the other hand, of course, are uh, livestock, beef uh, uh, products and, and poultry uh, in particular, in addition to other uh, products such as soy and coffee and, and other uh, agricultural products. But, but the real, the, the bulk of the amount that we uh, import from Brazil, which is about 1.5, 1.6 billion annually, is uh, beef uh, uh, and, and poultry. So we can say that the halal meat from Brazil mm -hmm. has quality then? Yeah, well, the meat itself has quality. Halal is simply the method of uh, slaughtering uh, in accordance with the requirements of the Islamic faith. Uh, so 
uh, but the quality of the beef and, and uh, I think the, the competitive pricing, uh, despite, of course, the challenges of, of the shipping, uh, remain the main factor why we are buying so much from Brazil. And Egypt is a, is a population of 104 million, so we consume a lot and, uh, and we don't produce enough. So uh, Brazil has been a good partner in providing that for us. Uh, you mentioned cotton, and the Egyptian thread is really famous because yes. it's really a luxury product, right? Yes. And how is the, the relation with uh, Brazil in this matter? There are imports, uh, uh, but in, in the bigger scheme of things, in the totality of Egyptian uh, uh, exports to Brazil, it doesn't rank very high. But of course, it's historically very famous and, and uh, almost, I dare say, prestigious Egyptian cotton. Uh, but we do uh, sell a lot of it to the United States and the EU in particular uh, as our main uh, trading partners. Uh, but we do sell as well to Brazil and it goes into manufacturing of, of textiles also in Brazil. And what about the free trade agreement between mm -hmm. Mercosur mm -hmm. and um, Egypt? Yeah. How did it change the relations with our country? Um, uh, on, on the micro level, it had an effect. It's a very important, of course, trade agreement. Uh, Mercosur is a large uh, bloc, and Egypt is, is a sizable country as well. Uh, and it did contribute. Uh, we're still now in the second phase, sort of, of implementation. It breaks down into four uh, groups of uh, products uh, and commodities. And uh, so uh, when it entered into force, the, it was category A that was uh, free of tax. Uh, and customs, and then B, which just entered into force, and now we're awaiting the lists that are in categories C and D. So it's, it's on track. Uh, it will gradually improve uh, the, the, the size of trade and access to markets on both sides. Um, but we, uh, the important thing is that we've been uh, wanting to hold the second joint committee between Egypt and Mercosur, because this is really the, the daily monitoring, the, the monitoring mechanism to make sure that it's fulfilling its objectives. And this will happen in a few uh, months, perhaps even a few weeks. So we're scheduling the next meeting, and this is very important, the joint committee between Egypt and Mercosur. And what can happen um, well, after that? Uh, it, it looks at, at the overall implementation, exactly what you were asking. It looks to see from Brazil and, and the Mercosur countries, what are the problems is everything going well? Do you, what can yeah, we change? What can be changed? And also from the Egyptian side. Plus some emergency issues, uh, uh, items that need to be uh, sensitive items that were not included, that need to be discussed and included. So it really uh, enforces and fine tunes the implementation of the agreement. And we've, it's been delayed a little bit, but we're glad to say I can announce now that it's going to be uh, held within the next uh, few months. Maybe just delayed a little bit, pandemic made it not as easy. And also this is the month of Ramadan, so maybe a little bit after that, so maybe in June or something. And about the pandemic, how did it change mm -hmm. uh, the situation, the relations, not only with Brazil, mm -hmm. but uh, of agribusiness yeah. and in your country? I think in both countries, in, in Brazil we've seen it uh, very, very clearly, and also in Egypt, these sectors, that provide food security to our countries and to the world uh, have, have been very strong and resilient. I mean, uh, Brazil should be proud of, of what has been done throughout this uh, period of time where productivity remained the same and exports and, and delivery of uh, imports was, uh, was almost consistent and unaffected. Uh, it's the same with Egypt. In fact, we, we saw growth in exports in uh, 2019 and then in 2020, hardly any drop whatsoever, because shipping uh, is continuing and people will continue to need uh, agricultural products. So these two sectors have been quite solid in both of our countries, so it hasn't been affected. We were able to continue to provide food security to, to our consumers. And are there other agreements um, between Brazil and Egypt that we should uh, try and, and talk about? Well, this is the main one in the area, of course, of, of trade, which encompasses uh, many, many areas, but agriculture in particular. Um, but uh, the relations, of course, between Brazil and Egypt go way beyond just uh, trade in, in agricultural products. We, we have a long-standing relationship. We have multiple levels of cooperation. Um, we have uh, military cooperation. We have security cooperation. We have, uh, of course, academic cooperation. Uh, each and every one of those areas that I spoke of 
is good, but the potential is much higher and we owe it uh, <clears throat> as diplomats, as patrons or people who are trying to push the relationship forward to go to the next level. And, and there are some ideas in the, in the pipes and, and we're going to have some good things happening in the near future. Um, to go to get to these challenges, mm -hmm. uh, is that innovation a solution? Well, there are multiple challenges. If we speak strictly about the trade area, um, I think that we need both in Egypt and Brazil to revisit the overall relationship and not be content with uh, simply buying and selling, which is import-export. We support import-export 100% and we want to increase it. But in 2021, in the 21st century, two countries the size of Brazil and Egypt and with their potential should be doing much more. The added value in import-export is minimal. There is no value added to each community or country by simply selling and buying. The added value comes when you have, for example, mutual investments, an Egyptian large investment in Brazil, creating jobs, bringing new technologies. And the same when a large Egypt, a Brazilian corporation or entity enters the Egyptian market and is present there. They bring their technology, their know-how, their expertise and their contacts, plus they create jobs. Number two, you have the potential to add value when we think strategically. Egypt is the gateway to Africa through our agreements of free trade in Africa and in the Arab world. So Egypt serves as an excellent gateway, for example, for Brazil to that region. This can't happen simply by buying and selling. It happens by a presence of businesses, Brazilian businesses in Egypt, taking advantage of our laws, our investment laws, and our access to these markets. And the reverse, vice versa, is the same. So these are other areas of added value. That's the number one challenge that I am focused on as ambassador now, to make sure that we take this relation to the next level. I've had this conversation with business people, with government officials, with uh, your wonderful, amazing Minister of Agriculture, Madam uh, Teresa Cristina, who sees it the same way. And she is uh, supportive of this notion that we need to move beyond buying and selling. And how can we help our producers to get this opportunity? Is that easy to enter the, the Egyptian market? Absolutely, yes? absolutely. And, and, and I'm looking right now as we speak at how to create corporations here in Brazil to explain to our Egyptian businesses how easy and simple it is to create a business here with a local partner. Of course, it makes it uh, very important and easier, but it, it brings you into this realm of all of South America, with Brazil being the largest economy, of course. Um, another challenge, as long as we're mentioning challenges, is um, the distance. It's just a reality. It adds cost and it makes some of the processes of export uh, complicated. Uh, so I think having more reliable shipping routes and direct shipping routes is very important. On the Arab side, the Arab League collectively is now creating a shipping company for South America. And of course, when we say South America, the entry point coming from the east to the west is Brazil. So your ports are going to be the entry point. So this is what we're doing on the Arab side. This isn't exclusively Egyptian. This is uh, from all of the Arab world. Uh, to have a collective entity that runs its own shipping lines, and that's a big, uh, big uh, push that we hope will, will help business and facilitate it on both sides. Uh, you already told me that there is another, um, another nice news that yeah. uh, we, now we're going to have a direct flight from mm -hmm. Brazil. It's something that you are working for a long time now. Yes, yes. Uh, of course, these things do take time, but, but it was one of the main objectives when I first arrived here was to make sure that there is a direct flight between Cairo and Sao Paulo. And uh, we've ironed out all of the difficulties. There's just a, a last very small agreement. And within that agreement, one very last small paragraph. So we're practically there. And I, I, I'm, I trust that both sides see how important it is. I can assure you that the business community, of course, has, has been speaking to me on both sides about it. Uh, but also uh, at, the, at the governmental level, we had uh, uh, our joint uh, political consultations. And it was almost the first item between officials. <clears throat> we had a, a, a video conference between our foreign ministers 
uh, I think, a couple of months ago. And uh, that was also one of the items that both at the political level and the technical level, everyone is convinced we need to have this route. So uh, on the legal uh, teams, we're fine-tuning the last part, and Egypt Air hopefully will be fly, flying directly. I mean, flying from here to Egypt could take anywhere between 30 and 35 hours with the stops. With a direct flight, you will have a 10, 11 hour direct flight. It's a huge difference. And we know that it would be really important to make business, right? And to agribusiness, it would be amazing. Everything, everything. I, I've, I've heard this. We have a, a very strong partner here in Brazil, in the uh, Brazilian Arab Chamber of Commerce in uh, Sao Paulo. And they've organized events that involve you know, our uh, businesses from both sides. And it's repeatedly been mentioned to us that even for businessmen, it's not just tourists. Of course, it helps tourism, and tourism is a very large industry in, in Egypt uh, and also in Brazil. But even for businessmen, they said, we have closer markets. So if it's a challenge to come and hold meetings and communicate and inspect facilities, <clears throat> then we might look at other markets. So having this direct flight will really change things. I think it's going to be a catalyst for the entirety of the relationship. And we also have to talk about tourism, right? Sure. Yeah. Your country, uh, of all the countries that I've visited, I, I have to say it's amazing, it's something that it's unforgettable. So uh, tell me, is there anything new happening there? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, there's a lot happening in Egypt, of course, in this area. But many people have uh, seen and, and spoken to me about uh, the recent event uh, that was uh, a parade moving 22 royal mummies from uh, the old museum in downtown Cairo to another museum at the outskirts, of, actually in old, Egypt, old Cairo as well. But that was just, we call it a prova, a, a rehearsal for the main event. The main event will be uh, later this year, the opening of the Grand Egyptian Museum, which is going to be the world's largest museum dedicated to a single civilization. And, and it's not just the size, it's the amount of artifacts that are going to be displayed and the uh, fact of where it's going to be, right? Exactly, because it's right next to the pyramids. It's going to be very convenient uh, for tourism, uh, for tourists uh, to see the pyramids and the museum. Uh, but also, because it's being built in, in 2021, uh, it's an ultra-modern facility that is going to be a very, very unique experience that we hope all tourists will enjoy. Of course, the world tourism industry is suffering because of the pandemic. Uh, we have great hopes now with, with the introduction of vaccines and, and gradual return to normalcy that we'll be opening the museum soon and the people will witness uh, an amazing, amazing uh, event uh, as well as a wonderful museum. Now let's talk a little bit about the climate change and the biodiversity and situation in Egypt in yeah. this matter. Yeah. Um, I, I, before coming to Brazil, I was responsible for uh, environmental affairs at the Foreign Ministry and. Uh, Climate change is the predominant issue that preoccupies us all in Brazil, of course. Brazil, for us, as developing countries, is, is, was always uh, one of the flag bearers for our positions. Uh, the Rio conventions, including the climate change uh, uh, convention, all of those are something. So Brazil has a very integral role. Uh, collectively, uh, developing countries have worked together uh, very well. In short, this is a problem that the world is having to deal with, um, developing and developed countries together. Unfortunately, the negotiations are usually focusing on developed countries versus developing countries. We think that we are owed by developed countries assistance in implementation of climate change obligations in the form of capacity building, technology, and provision of finance. We can't do it alone. We need to develop, just like developed countries have developed and built their wealth at the expense of our climate and our planet. We can't be told, now stop your development, stop everything, and you have to be committed 100%. We want to do our part, but it's conditional, I dare say, on provision of technology, capacity, and finance. And we're not getting all of that to the extent that we wish. That doesn't mean Egypt and Brazil and other large developing countries don't want to do our part. We will do our part. But we are also trying to find the right balance to provide 
sustainable development for our own people. So this is a big challenge, but we will all have to do our part in the days to come. So uh, to confront this challenge, mm -hmm. um, how is the work with innovation and technology, for example? Well, innovation technology, I am a strong believer that they are the catalyst. They are, in them lies the solution for everything. Uh, we, uh, for example, solar energy in, in all fields, of course, as a production of energy, but also in the field of agriculture. Um, if you just look at solar energy 15 years ago, it was very unsustainable because of the cost of the solar panels. Once the technology became available, everybody rushed to it. It's clean and efficient. So no one wants to not be clean and not uh, uh, curb their emissions. But the cost of the technology sometimes is prohibitive. In fact, Egypt now, in the south of Egypt, close to the city, historical city of Aswan, uh, is constructing uh, the world's largest solar farm in the area of Bimban. That's amazing. It, it is, and it is going to provide a, a large percentage of Egypt's energy mix through clean solar energy. But this was only possible, back to your question, once the technology became available at an affordable cost. It's because we're talking about uh, small farmers too, and yes, these yes. people don't uh, have the conditions, the money to, exactly. to buy for that. Exactly. And uh, Egypt, access to, we're, we're glad to say, access to uh, energy in Egypt is more than 97%. So everyone has electricity. But we want this to be clean electricity. We don't want to rely on fossil fuels which increase the emissions and lead to climate change. So uh, that's just one example of how technology can make us more sustainable. Um, we need to move from, from the unsustainable methods of the Industrial Revolution until the early century, uh, past century, into the realm of the 21st century where we can find the right balance between achieving development and growth and the welfare of our people without damaging uh, our planet. We only get one Earth. So technology is key to it, but access to it is not even. Developed countries uh, may have some of these technologies, but they insist on the intellectual property rights. We have to find the right way to work together to ensure that they are contributing uh, to the sustainability of the planet through provision of these technologies in a manner that doesn't affect their research capacity, of course, and expenditure, but it can't be on a commercial basis. It should be something that all the countries should or could replicate, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Of course, it's difficult. Uh, I'm on the receiving end. I understand that a large company in Germany or the UK or Japan or the US developing these technologies would not want to say, well, I spent all this money and I, I'm, I'm not going to give it to you. So, but there has to be a wise fashion whereby we can come together and find a solution to allow these technologies to be made available to developing countries at non-commercial prices. Uh, we can say that the agricultural relations are really strong. What about the political relations with Brazil? Yeah. Well, of course, Egypt and Brazil have enjoyed uh, historically very strong political relations. Uh, Brazil is the largest country in South America and uh, the bellwether and the leader in pol uh, political direction in the region. Egypt, of course, is the largest and uh, one of the most important countries in our region as well. So natural allies has been the description for these two countries. Uh, we've consistently you know, supported each other at the UN and, and various fora, not just because of the strength of the relation, but because we see eye to eye on issues of disarmament, on peace and security, on development. So it was natural to see this. Um, to be very honest, in, in more recent times, we're seeing a change in uh, some of the positions of Brazil, particularly within the UN. Um, issues that uh, historically uh, Brazil has supported uh, on uh, Palestinian rights, on, on uh, nuclear disarmament in the International uh, Atomic Energy Agency, uh, we've seen changes in Brazil's uh, position. Um, as diplomats, it's our job not only to usher the relationship and push it forward, but to manage differences and make sure that there's communication and better understanding of why uh, we're seeing this change in Brazil's position, particularly because it's a change from historically held 
positions in support of normal uh, rights of people, particularly people under occupation. So uh, this is one of the issues that is in part of the political relationship, but as I said, we have a continual dialogue about it. We had our joint uh, commission, uh, political level, at the foreign ministry level, and uh, discussed this issue, and we also had conversations between the foreign ministers. So uh, the only way to address any potential differences in views is uh, through dialogue and a continuous conversation, which we're having with Brazil. But the political relation is strong, it's diverse, it covers multiple areas, and I think that in the totality, we support each other's positions on the core issues globally. Mr. Ambassador, is there any story or episode you'd like to share with us about you being here in Brazil? I'd like to know what you think about our country mm -hmm. and uh, if there is something that you would like to share. Well, it's an amazing country and it's amazing for multiple reasons, but, but really, and this is not cliche, it is the people. Um, I come from a country where people are very open and warm and they like to talk to strangers. Uh, Brazilians are identical to Egyptians in that sense. And throughout my career in the diplomatic uh, field, I've always felt particularly close, on a social level, of course, to my Brazilian uh, counterparts because of the overall attitude to life. We like to do our jobs and do them well, but we like to be relaxed and, and have fun and joke about everything. This is something that's common between our two peoples. And I've seen it everywhere I've gone here. Despite the language barrier, I'm still learning Portuguese and, and many people don't speak uh, another language besides Portuguese here. Yet, even using sign language, you can tell that these are very warm people who just want to get to know you and chat with you. So uh, it's just been an amazing experience, despite the pandemic, of course. Um, and, and, and we pray for all of humanity, but I'm here in Brazil and, and my heart goes out to those who have lost loved ones. And we, we were working on some issues together to provide support, uh, mutual support, but also from Egypt to some Brazilian entities in some medical supplies and other areas. It's a difficult time for all of us. Um, we're in it together and we'll come out stronger together as well. Thank you very much. Is there something else you'd like to share? No, that you covered everything and uh, this is a great relationship and I'm very happy to be part of building uh, the bridges and the ties between these two great nations. Thank you very much for your time, Your Excellency. Thank you. My pleasure. No campo diplomático de hoje, nós falamos sobre as relações comerciais do Brasil com o Egito e a cooperação no agronegócio. Um destaque são as oportunidades de investimento e os desafios para adicionar valor aos nossos produtos e ampliar nossas relações. Você pode ver este programa e também outras entrevistas no nosso canal no YouTube. Aproveite para seguir a gente nas redes sociais, arroba Agromais TV. Continue com a programação do Agromais, seu canal voltado para o agronegócio 24 horas. Obrigada pela companhia. A gente se vê.